The All Things XR Podcast. Where you can get the best AR VR analyzers from the biggest names in the field. Hi everyone, welcome to the All Things SR Podcast, I'm Mojtaba. In today's episode, we talk about photogrammetry with one of the top experts in this field, Azad Balabanian. Hi Azad. Hi Mojtaba. Thanks very much for accepting my invitation for the All Things XR Podcast. Yeah, thank you for being here. I'm a fan. Sure, thanks <laughs> very much. Can you tell us more about yourself and what you do? Yeah. Um, so as you said, I'm Azad Balabanian. Um, I guess I've done a few different things, but the thing I've been concentrating on uh, recently for the last few years has been uh, combining kind of photogrammetry, which is a version of 3D scanning with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality uh, headsets, um, as well as a lot of other kind of applications of it. But VR and AR is kind of like one of the more core focuses that uh, that I have and the company that I work for does as well, which is called uh, Realities IO. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, um, for those of our listeners who don't know about photogrammetry, can you tell us what it is? Sure. Um, yeah, so it's basically, it's a way of creating very accurate 3D maps or 3D scans of an environment. So I say maps because it it used to be used and it's and continued to be to this day being used uh, to, to create maps. Um, and it's a way of basically taking uh, pictures, overlapping photos from different perspectives and then finding common features between these pictures and then understanding how the camera moved between uh, those pictures being taken. And from that kind of understanding uh, uh, understanding the 3D geometry of the space. So that, that's kind of like the overview uh that's kind of the idea behind like the, the algorithms that actually run this thing but a more simpler way of actually understanding it is if you think of augmented reality and slam um and how kind of like you know positional tracking works mm -hmm. with uh, inside out camera system it's doing the same exact th thing basically it's looking at it's finding features in the room and a feature is basically something with like high contrast so uh, let's say like a dot or black dot on a white wall uh, it looks at that feature, and then when you move your head left and right, it understands that that feature remains the same place, but that feature, compared to the other features in the room, um, they ha can now have a different configuration. And from that, you can kind of do some geometry and understand where mm -hmm. the, the camera or the headset moves. So that's the that's the kind of basic idea behind it. And, and so now when you combine, like, drones and cameras and, um, you know, high-resolution cameras, you can now take a lot of photos very uh, programmably. So basically you can do it repeatedly. Um, and now with like basically powerful gaming PCs, you can uh, crunch those, uh, those photos into a high resolution 3D model uh, that you can then use in VR. So one of those use cases is kind of, uh, it is the idea that the, my company started on it, which is kind of this idea of virtual tourism. Um, it's to take people to places where they cannot really go to, um, either for access reasons or whatever accessibility. Um, and it's, uh, the idea of like this photorealistic reconstruction of the, of the environment, uh, can be really interesting or powerful. And so that was kind of the more consumer focused, uh, idea behind it, but also enterprise, you know, there's a lot of enterprise applications as to why you would want to have a, an accurate 3d scan of a space. Uh, to interact with in VR and one another, uh, yeah, an enterprise idea is, uh, kind of training. So you could scan, uh, especially if it's something like the International Space Station where, um, you need to know where everything is. You need to know where every button is. All that kind of spatial memories are hard to form out of like a textbook or a video. Um, but it's much better, better if you're actually there, you know, moving around and creating those muscle memory of like where, where things are, how you move to get to those things and how you do the things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, surely. Um, so, Azad, photogrammetry is not a super new technology. 
but it has surely changed over time. Can you tell us a bit on the history of it? Sure. I honestly, I, I can't tell you too much about the history um, as it's kind of, I, I came into this since like 2014, 2015. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not like one of the original map makers that has been, that went up in a, in a hot air balloon, you know, <laughs> taking pictures. And then, well, they had, they were literally doing manual kind of feature, you know, detection and triangulation. I, I guess it, it is just basic, maybe not basic, but it, it is geometry of what you're doing to understand uh, where the pictures were taken from. But um, the, I guess, you know, it did literally start in the late 1800s uh yeah. and the inventor is someone with a last name uh Finzerwalder, which is uh, apparently an uncommon german last just uh, an uncommon german last name which is funny because uh, one of our two co-founders at realities io is also uh named Finzerwalder, and he's one of the <laughs> pioneers in vr photogrammetry so he's <laughs> yeah he likes to great. think maybe he's a descendant we're not exactly sure but <laughs> basically it used to be a lot of people that were interested in surveying uh, interested in making maps, um, interested in understanding kind of the, the world around them. Um, and then over time, um, cameras got better, processing became obviously more powerful, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I guess the need for it also started to grow. And so that that's kind of where we are today. I see. So how did it change after the introduction of AR Kit and AR Core? Um, do you see any difference? Um, in, in what exactly? In photographic? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, not particularly. So our, our, the way I capture things or the way most people do photogrammetry doesn't require any augmented reality per se. Um, although we are now starting to see some mobile apps, uh, mobile photogrammetry apps for iPhone and Android using a lot of the things that were built for AR kit and AR core mm-hmm. as kind of that initial, um, slam, you know, tracking. And to do, uh, to basically build upon the, the, that, the initial kind of like camera solve. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a company, like there's companies like 60 AI, uh, Abound Labs, and there's one more particle engine. All three of Mm -hmm. those are now doing, uh, are concentrating on like mobile photogrammetry solutions. But for my, for my purposes, like, you know, outside of the Realities IO company, which we do a lot of, um, like enterprise contracts as well as we've, we've been building our own internal uh, in-house photogrammetry pipeline, which basically uses the all the the best results of like some of the photogrammetry softwares that exist, like Reality Capture, um, and combines them with uh, other other software that we need to be using in our pipeline into a singular modular kind of node-based system. Uh, but apart from all of that, I like to kind of look at this more of a, a, as a photographer like i'm a you know how did early photographers approach the art of photography what did they think was interesting to capture how did they do it you know it also required a lot of chemistry back then you had to really like innovate on the chemistry side to, to get good at photography um so i'm applying some of those ideas into photogrammetry and and uh thinking like okay what how can we approach this new or kind of this adva- more advanced photography art form um in a 3d way uh, what, what can you do with it? When can you capture it? What can you use to capture? You know, how much money does it require for you to do it? Um, and then, yeah, what, how, in what ways can you present your art? Um, is it exclusively only to VR, AR? No, like there's, uh, you could actually create really beautiful 2D render videos, like fly through videos. And now my kind of my favorite way of using it is uh, in in these volumetric and light field displays. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the the one that I use the most is called the Looking Glass display. Yeah, yeah, it's I've a seen very those. you've seen it. Yeah, it's really fascinating because these displays are coming. You know, people are working on these displays, um, and the only content that you know most people have access to is just computer generated content. It's mm-hmm. animation. It's three D models. But uh, of course, we're we're humans, and we like to look at things. From the real world so one of the few ways of actually bringing in the real real world into these displays is i think photogrammetry um and and to actually like use it for filmmaking for 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 games for animation um so there's a lot of interesting use cases that i think 
are still unexplored. And so I'm really interested in exploring those. Uh huh. Yeah. You mentioned 60 AI and other companies, um, trying mm -hmm. to do a real time photogrammetry. Um, Ubiquiti 6 is also doing something similar and the results were That's interesting. Right, I them. Yeah. 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 Have you seen the, the results? Mm -hmm. So they're, um, I guess I'm trying to compare the differences between the companies. Uh, some of them, so 60 AI is much more of a back end, I think, back end technology for people to build upon. So, uh, I know Torch, which is an, you know, an AR, uh, design, uh, tool to, to use on your phone uses 60 AI to do basically real time meshing of your room so that you can hide things behind, you know, you, with AR, you have the problem of occlusion. Um, at least in current technology in 2020, uh, it's, it, we, we, we don't have good ways of, of handling uh, occlusion in AR. So w if you have a mesh of the room, you have, if you have a 3D scan of the room, uh, then you have a, a perfect understanding of like what should be hidden behind the table and what shouldn't be as in a, from a virtual yeah. object. So um, that's 60. So in terms of um, the split, uh, uh, 60 or sorry, Ubiquiti 6 and their app Displayland, they're, yeah, they're basically trying to make a consumer facing uh, 3D scanning or more photogrammetry, uh, photogrammetry app and um, all, everything that gets processed in the cloud. And then they send you a, a, a 3D model. I mean, from um, quite honestly, like I did, I did also try it. I, I like to keep my eyes to the ground and the quality that you could achieve by doing real time photogrammetry is like, orders of my magnitude less than yeah. what you can achieve with uh, a normal uh, when i say normal i mean like you know non real time photogrammetry processing on a pc using you know like cuda and nvidia gpus um, so to me i'm not interested as much on on the results i think i i'm i am really interested in real time photogrammetry as a feedback tool you know as i'm scanning something sometimes it's hard to um, it's, it's hard to remember what you already scanned and what you didn't. And especially if you're collaborating with a sec second person, um, you want to have an understanding of what you're both scanning. Um, so I can see real time photogrammetry being awesome at kind of helping you kind of get a heat map of what you've already covered and what you haven't. But, uh, in terms of like the quality, I'm, I'm okay with waiting, you know, a few hours, uh, to get something that's much higher resolution, denser, more accurate. Um, so th that's just, that's just my, uh, my opinion, but I think it, it, it could be a really good way of actually people getting their hands or their feet wet. Um, if they're interested in this technology, uh, to just have a free tool that they can use on their phone. Um, so, and I think that is actually the, the, the point of entry. That's I wrote a guide, um, two years ago on medium that actually is like the first thing. It's one of the few things. It's one of the first things that po that pops up on uh -huh. Google when you search for photogrammetry. Yeah, uh, I've, I've seen that. Getting started guide. Um, yeah. And it's all about basically how do you get started with photogrammetry with an iPhone. Um, I'm not using any of the real-time, uh, you know, proprietary photogrammetry software. Like everything that's in the article is, is open source software that you can use. Um, so it's all free and whatnot. So that's a good, I, I would say if anyone is interested in, in getting started, uh, I would start there. Um, but yeah, check out the other, uh, real time, real time photogrammetry apps. There's, there's, it's, it's always really nice to get real time feedback. You know, you can see the thing that you're scanning. You're like, oh, that's the relationship of how the thing, you know, the quality of what gets reconstructed based on where my camera is and how I'm moving and where I should be. Cause it's a, not a very intuitive way, I think of, of, of taking pictures of something like it's a. You look very silly when you're doing photography. <laughs> let me just tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you Have you done any yourself? Yeah, um, I'm or... awful at it, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, I'm awful well, at it. I'll just say you're probably not awful. You're just inexperienced. That's all it is. <laughs> I don't, th I don't is... think you know you could be great or terrible. Uh, per se <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, uh, it it's it's got a lot of tricks i think it's a it's got a lot of tricks and you have to be really experienced like yourself to do a good photogrammetry um especially one of my other questions uh, do you think it is uh, easier to do photogrammetry of environments or on objects um i think objects are easier to start with 
Mm-hmm. Like, they're much easier to start with. Um, something as simple as putting a teddy bear on a table and then basically walking around the teddy bear and taking pictures of it from every angle. Um, that's that's the basic idea of how you create a 3D model from just 2D pictures. Um, but in terms of environments, uh, it is definitely more challenging because they've just, by the sheer size of things, like let's say you want to scan a room, um, that's much a much larger surface area to cover with images than uh, you would need for a teddy bear. So that requires more images. That requires uh, you to also, you know, move throughout the, the room. That requires you also to know how to take the images so that the 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 uh, cameras solve. Like when I say camera solve, it's like um, it's basically so that the positional tracking doesn't lose sense of like where the camera was when mm-hmm. it was taking the picture, even though that's not happening in real time. Um, so that that sort of technical, there's yeah, I guess the, those are the technical the ch- challenges uh, that you have to think about as you're capturing something. Um, but then there's also things like uh, ISO and sensor noise. So if you want to scan a room, I always tell people you know use a DSLR and use a tripod, and then you're going to end up doing uh, a picture. Like a, each each picture is going to be like a one second long exposure rather than uh-huh. you know it's not it's not a click click it's a click click you know that's 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 yeah. why it has to be on a tripod and that's why um you need just need to do this you know a couple hundred times of images to move around um and to get like really high quality scans that, that if if by the way for your listeners if they're having a hard time visualizing these things uh i would recommend uh looking on sketch like uh, if you google my name and sketch Bab, you'll see a lot of my 3d models that i've posted there uh that you can explore um either in the browser or even in vr um, and i also open source most of my photogrammetry that i've posted in Sketchfab. so that's i'm um, in an effort basically to see what developers can do with it um because i think you know when there's one thing is to solve the capturing and the processing side of photogrammetry and you know opening that up for people to be able to capture whatever they want but the other side is also the use case like what can you what do you do with this you know what are the interesting things that can be done and so uh, i'm interested in tackling both of those problems and and on a personal side i'm also just open sourcing all the quick photogrammetry things that i do like over weekends um for for app developers to you know if you uh, just as an idea for you know if you're interested in augmented reality you can download a 3D scan of a of an environment and actually do prototyping of how an AR app should work in a scene like that. And then if you end up doing prototyping this in VR, the video that you record ends up looking like realistic. You know, if you even if it's just your headset cam that you're recording in VR, um, because the photogrammetry is captured from photos and it's real like photorealistic, uh-huh. the entire experience kind of looks like augmented reality um even though you're just simulating it in vr uh-huh. so that's that's the sort of kind of uh thing that i'm interested in, in seeing people um get, get creative with and and i've got actually have had a few examples of um, some of my friends doing really awesome prototypes um with photogrammetry so um yeah it's in my interest to see more <laughs> yeah um you mentioned prototyping in ar and vr and also mentioned um torch app our listeners can mm-hmm. listen to my conversation with paul reynolds ceo of torch app on episode four of this podcast um also you also mentioned um using photogrammetry models in uh, ar and vr um but uh, photogrammetry models are usually very heavy and uh, not optimized for ar and vr environments uh, what can we do about that yeah i I'll, i can provide a few tips here also um so the the problem actually i wouldn't say is about like piece of people's computers or pcs or, or phones not being powerful enough it's more the other way around like the photogrammetry models typically have not been optimized for uh to run on on smaller devices and um, that's mostly because people don't have the tools or the knowledge to do that um, which used to be me, I would say like a year and a half ago before I joined Realities and worked with like proper 3D developers. Um, so that's that that's a big uh, need that also we had at Realities um, to do basically really large scale photogrammetry mm-hmm. environments in VR. 
Um, so uh, Realities has a free, uh, it was actually one of the, I don't think they were a launch title for the Vive, but came out basically within the first few months uh-huh. um, called, uh, it's just called Realities. And it basically, there's like five or six different, uh, these cinematic uh, experiences that you can download um like places like death valley cologne cathedral in germany um these uh glaciers up in canada like basically all these really awesome um non-linear kind of storytelling uh like i I guess film film would be one way of saying it um experiences that you can download and, and try out um those are very hard for most people to be able to like even if they were able to scan something of that size uh, but to be able to have that, uh, for it to be optimized to run in VR, it's uh, not trivial. So that's something that we've been working on building this tool. Um, we haven't really named it yet, uh, but it, we're calling it a pipeline of, of using basically different tools uh, as you do in a, in a photogrammetry workflow uh, to put it all together into a node-based system where you can just throw in a mesh, uh, your output from reality capture, a textured mesh, mm-hmm. and then uh, optimize it all the way to have something ready that could work on a, um, a Oculus Quest, you know, a mobile ready yeah. asset. Even, uh, you know, it could be huge. It could be a very large scene, but um, we have ways of basically uh, chunking it, cutting it, uh, like basically cutting the mesh into as many parts as needed. And then each chunk has having its own UV unwrap. Um, with its own set of textures. Now we have really amazing kind of like uh, uh, different ways of basically uh, uh, ways of marking areas as like high detail areas to keep both the geometry and the texture resolution high, but then uh, having it having other areas be lower. So so things like white walls or, or the ground or things in very far you know surrounding areas that you don't really need to be at in VR, you know, you just see the mountains in the background, those don't need to have as much higher resolution. Um, you know, they, they don't need to be as dense in the geometry and texture resolution. Um, so now we have like really good ways of gradually um, decimating things, gradually uh, unwrapping things. And so the, the, to me, this is a dream. Like uh, a year ago, this, you know, as a freelancer, this would have been, uh, close to impossible and so i'm really excited that this is something we're working on unfortunately we don't i I don't i can't say in terms of like public availability of this tool yet um we're 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 thinking and working with partners about like where this would make sense and who would be interested in it but that's that's just kind of where um the state of the industry is and but at least it does show that like there's actually going to be a lot of progress made in this field over the next five years so if this is something interesting to you then i think it's going to get easier every year as um as the years come by uh uh-huh, yeah that's interesting one of the things i was thinking about photogrammetry uh, was that in today's techniques we solely really rely on computer vision to do the process and guess the position of the camera and generate meshes and etc but uh, with today's sensors and today's technologies like SLAM, can we augment the process of uh, photogrammetry with those things? You could use GPS also for that. And, you know, it's not as accurate as, as computer vision, mm-hmm. but that initial camera alignment phase is not really the the bottleneck of, of the whole thing. You know, if that that's something that can work in real time on a phone, mm-hmm. um, clearly it's you know we, we, people have made progress in having that run in real time um but it's much more about kind of the actual mesh reconstruction the actual texture generation from the photos you know the texture blending there's there's a lot of things that require uh gpu well G, G, yeah gpus are important and then like they're important for basically creating the depth maps for each photo um and as well as the texturing so like but the, the people get hung up on GPUs. It's it's mm-hmm. not really a G, GPU heavy thing. I mean that that helps for certain phases. Um, but all, basically, every step along along the route, like better computers, will always uh, help help on the the generation of a photogram tree. But like like I said, the, the the end result shouldn't be very heavy, and that's something that that really we're we're concentrating and working on. Uh-huh. And if, I guess I can provide some. Uh, tips here for if people are you know have done photogrammetry and they want you know they're yeah, interested sure. in making it more optimized i would always my rule of thumb is um in terms of poly size it's like 
decimate down to a hundred thousand polys like that. Most people would leave it in the millions. Like don't do that. Decimate to a hundred thousand polys, especially if it's like a smaller scene, if it's a room or if it's a cut out of a room, if it's a, a teddy bear, whatever, like a hundred K is a good rule of thumb. And that also works uh, for Sketchfab. Like um, for Sketchfab, you don't want your, your model to wait to, to load for so long. Um, and then I would do like 100k text or 100k poly and maybe like five 4k textures. Um, it's kind of my rule of thumb. Um, you could, if you're interested in also seeing how well these things run, like I said, check out the models that I have on Sketchfab. Um, and these they're typically around this uh, these specs. And you can kind of also see over the years uh, how unoptimized my previous work <laughs> used to be compared to where they are now. Um, and there's also, you know, I would also recommend tools like mesh mixer, which is a very simple, uh-huh. um, oh, okay. Maybe not simple, very like, <laughs> uh, accessible 3d modeling software yeah. uh, that doesn't require you to, you know, uh, learn the ins and outs of blender. Um, but it's a much, much, uh, it's, it's a tool basically built for 3d printing. Um, but I don't use it for that. I just use it as a really good 3D modeling and uh, editing software. Mm-hmm. So I have some uh, documentation about that also on the uh, Getting Started Guide. Uh huh. We will surely put links on the description of this podcast. Um, also, you mentioned photogrammetry on large scales. Um, what was the largest scale you've done photogrammetry on? <laughs> um, this is a project we just about finished actually this week it's being shown at ces next week so i can't oh, talk i can't mention it yet uh-huh. um because uh, until after they, it comes out and we get the okay from the company and whatnot but um it was basically the biggest the largest scale thing we've ever captured or that i've even worked on is uh this 10 kilometer long valley mountain wow. valley stretch uh in southeast asia and uh, we were using uh, four drones and four drone operators uh, with automated flight pa- flight plans uh, to capture all these environments. And it was basically it's uh, it's going to be this VR fly through experience. Um, you're sitting in something and then you fly through this environment, and it's beautiful. There's a fog and a dragon and beautiful music, and so. It was uh, one of the projects I was happy that I was able to work on. Ah, uh, is it published? No, so that's going to be. Um, it's for a company, an unnamed company uh-huh. at CES. Uh-huh. Uh, I guess they they will be um, demoing a product that they're going to be showing uh, and using VR. Basically, uh, mm-hmm. you'll be flying through these this mountain valley. But basically, it was a a total of like I think ten thousand or or. 11,000 images that were mm-hmm. captured for just that one scene um, uh, over the course of, I don't know how, how many hours, but actually the capture time itself, like when the pictures were being taken was not so, didn't take so much time. It was more about the processing, the, uh-huh. the post-processing yeah, of the images yeah. than the, the reconstruction of the photogrammetry and then the multiple iterations that we had to do on optimizing uh, the, 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 the mesh and the textures so that we can have it run on a specific computer. So there's, I think with photogrammetry, there's a lot of iteration. You just have to do like trial and error so many times. Um, and those are also things that we've kind of built tools for and how and make our lives a little bit easier yeah. with the file management and fol- folder management. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, uh, what headset would you use for that? Would you use quest or not? And, you mentioned that you would need a computer to run such a scene. Um, can you tell? Uh, For that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but generally, Quest has been, or mobile has been, a uh, big focus, actually, of David Fincival, the, the one of the two founders. Uh, he realized early on that, like, uh, he, he was one of the, actually, the first people that was doing photogrammetry in VR, like, using mm-hmm. like, both, like, a DK1, um, like, from way back in the day. And he realized that, like, you know, for for any for any of this technology to become more accessible, it needs to be it needs to run on like smaller and smaller hardware. And as also Oculus was focusing a lot on mobile mobile VR with Quest, um, it seems like we actually made the right bet to not to concentrate less on like um, 
on trying to do photogrammetry using a mobile device and much more about being able to run high quality photogrammetry exactly. on a mobile device. And so there's still actually, we, oh man, I guess we don't have the dates or the, 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 uh, approval to talk about it. We, we do actually have a, an experience coming out on the quest, um, in 2020 that people That's will be able to experience. And it's an underwater and actually photogrammetry scan that really? a group of, yeah, 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 a group of Swedish, um, researchers, uh, who are, let's see. Yeah, they're a group of Swedish researchers that are also scuba divers. Um, they did a photogrammetry scan of something that they discovered uh, a few years ago. And uh, it was also a huge data set. It's like 20,000 images or something. Um, wow. So we've been working with them and another studio on building a VR experience um, on the quest for it. So. Wow. That's going to be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't seen a photogrammetry from underwater. But um, uh, how do you manage so much motion um, um, scenes like that? Mo motion um, in what way? Well, you know, what, motion of water, motion of um, the creatures, ah. the fishes. Yes. Um, yeah, looking at the images themselves, they're definitely like the, the view, the... Um, I mean, I'm trying to remember what the real term is, but basically the visibility really drops off. Like mm -hmm. the fall off is very short in, in water, right? The light doesn't go as far. So all the images have to be taken from very close, uh, close up, um, and uh -huh. next to each other, which actually makes alignment of the images themselves harder. If you don't have overview images that kind of, uh, encompass the entire subject that you were capturing, you know, if you just have zoomed in, uh, small close-up images all stacked up next to each other and less images that were are from further away looking at everything um, it's made very hard for the for the software to understand where these images were taken from and how to align things to each other mm -hmm. so there's a lot of manual work that these researchers actually oh. did for the last few years on this data set um, so it's it's an absolute nightmare <laughs> <laughs> scenario to do photogrammetry in water but I commend anyone and everyone that has done it. There's a few examples that you'll also find at Sketchfab of a few other researchers that have, um, like scanned, uh, like planes that have been, you know, destroyed underwater and, uh, other interesting things that you might find. Mm. So there's, there's, uh, you know, there might, it might get easier with under, underwater drones. Uh, I saw, I read an article about that recently also on, I think on the Sketchfab blog about doing underwater photogrammetry with the drones, um, like underwater drones. Um, but it's definitely not easy. Like it, it you know, get better at photogrammetry in the, in, uh, in underground first. And once, you know, you feel good enough <laughs> then and you understand the, the principles there, then you could, you know, play on, uh, on difficult, on a difficulty challenge and, uh, can go underwater to do your scanning. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, uh, as that we mentioned, uh, photogrammetry at larger scales. Um, you know, some AR cloud companies like Escape Technologies, um, basically try to do some kind of um photogrammetry of big cities. You know, they hired mm -hmm. our local photographers to take a large amount of photos uh, from the cities and tr they try to build the point cloud of cities so you can localize yourselves um, using only computer mm -hmm. vision. How do you think um, uh, photogrammetry can ha help the AR cloud space? Yeah, no, it's clearly kind of a core part of the AR cloud as as we kind of know it. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I mean, I, people not, might not be aware, but also like you know, all of Google Earth is photogrammetry done by a combination of pictures from satellites and pictures from planes. Mm -hmm. So if you ever you know try Google Earth VR with the uh, the very detailed cities, those are all done from planes. So, you know, shooting at angles, um, and, and it's just basically like I don't even know how many images. So clearly, like the, this is a big part of uh, the future ecosystem. It's also a big part of like cars. It seems like for it, autonomous vehicles, um, HD maps seems like it's a big vector uh, for for self driving cars to grow in. Although I don't think that's fixing all that's all of its issues. I think it's actually only the first first part of it. But um, yeah, basically the idea of having 3D maps is starting to become very important. Um, so I guess it's a, it is a very big part. Uh, localization is a big need for, 
uh, both AR and self-driving cars. So clearly having some sort of a map of the world to localize to uh, maybe is, is a good idea. I don't, I don't know. I, this is not something I uh, particularly, you know, like work in in terms of like localization and AR cloud, but it really is. But I guess you can make the bet that, um, you know, it's interesting that everyone now has, you know, a phone and a camera and an internet connected camera. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, if you can, if you're combining uh, those to create a detailed and live updating map of the world, um, maybe there's something there. I, I don't know. I think that's also what all these AR cloud companies are betting on um, is people's phones being the, their sensors, like a crowdsourced uh, map of the world. Uh, although I guess you're going to be competing with uh, companies that have dedicated uh, capturing teams like Google Maps and I guess Apple Maps and uh, I think who else? Bing Maps is actually quite large. Yeah. Um, Yandex, I think also. Um, uh, oh, sorry. There's also no, uh, Here Here Maps. I believe either they were part of Nokia or are now part of Nokia. Yeah, but, yeah, they were part of Nokia. Oh. Um. Yeah. I think Uber acquired them, but I'm not sure. Ah. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I think I, again, I don't know particularly how well it works. I mean, the idea is, is nice. You know, the idea of having f- people be your crowdsourcing, uh, a real live map of the world for you. And especially in the areas where it's the most important, which is populated areas, you know, that's where you want your AR headset to localize in, you know, more mm-hmm. than I guess in the middle of the desert. So it's kind of, it makes sense as to why you'd want to do that. But I guess it's <laughs> the idea sounds, not so difficult, but the in execution, it's actually very hard. Yeah. Um, so that's something I don't know how well it's working. Uh, the examples of crowdsourced photogrammetry that I have seen have been much more for like cultural uh, heritage uh, preservation, or maybe I wouldn't say preservation, like documentation, where you know a thousand people have taken pictures of the uh, of Palmyra in Syria before like ISIS destroyed it, oh. and so. Uh, you know, different organizations have tried to find, find all the images of it that they can, try to throw them into photogrammetry software, see if they all align. And if they do, then they can reconstruct, uh, you know, an actual uh, mesh of the environment without even and never, you know, sending a team to capture it there. So there's, there's, there's ideas like that that do work. Not great, but they do work to a certain extent um, that I guess are neat, but I don't know if yeah, I, I, I'm just not sure. I, I don't. I don't have enough information to know uh, how well this would work for for AR clouds. Yeah, those use cases are great, and that's where you sense the power of technology. Also, you also mentioned your works at realities.io on simulating real world locations via photogrammetry. Um, in case we want to create oases like worlds in virtual reality in future. I think creating these worlds from scratch will be very hard and it will be a good thing uh, to have many of the real world locations simulated in VR worlds. But the bottleneck here is creating these contents. What do you think we can do to simplify this process? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how important... Hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe it is, but let me restate that. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to original what I was saying. <laughs> I don't know how important it is for like to have the real world be in VR for like any VR uh, multiplayer, multi-user, whatever, Oasis-like environment Mm -hmm. to be relevant or useful, right? Yeah, most video games that people spend a lot of time in, you know, that those aren't really particularly based in the real world. So Uh um, I don't imagine that a a multiplayer map needs to be uh, exactly the real world. Although there are a lot of interesting things that can, can come from it. Um, you know, you can imagine, uh, this scenario where I've, I've, um, where you, you go to the beach and you be, you know, create a sand castle mm-hmm. with your friends. Um, you can 3D scan that and then actually create a game, you know, around that in VR where you're a tiny person. You can actually like, you know, fly a spaceship or like a dirt bike or something through your, um, sand castle and have that be an actual mo- map of a multiplayer game. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the scenarios like that are very interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think that could be actually something that, uh, you know, is like a real, uh, a real thing that people can use, for, um, maybe in the next few years or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, to be quite honest, I'm not 100% convinced that an oasis is exactly what 
you know, will make VR the thing that people want it to be. Um, I found many use cases that don't <laughs> that don't <laughs> involve the Oasis, and it's still extremely useful of yeah, a sure. technology for me. But all, I know we, I guess we all know that multiplayer and multi-user environments are very important. You know, if we learn anything from the web, you know, web 2.0 and social networks, it's like people want to collaborate and be together. That's uh, that gen- that can generate a lot of um, use cases without you as a developer even creating it for you. So, in that sense, then y- yes, definitely. And uh, having and sharing a real world environment like your room is very cool. Um, I've done that with uh, some of uh, like my podcast listeners in a photogrammetry scan of my room. Uh, so we had a meetup in there in VR chat. And so uh-huh. that was really interesting because they got to see, you know, what is uh, the, what does it look like behind the, the behind the, the microphone, behind the camera, mm-hmm. you know, where's, what kind of gear do I have? What is it? So that, that sort of stuff is very interesting. And I, I think there could be a lot more, um, more, more examples of that if the capturing became easier. And uh-huh. uh, so your your question is how can the capturing and, and how can this be more accessible? And the answer is it is getting way more accessible, both from the uh, phone perspective, where now everyone has a pretty decent camera and also has like processing power on their phones or the cloud to use uh, to to 3D scan things. Um, although you know, arguably the the, the quality isn't there yet. For, for like for me at least to justify that that's something that I will be exclusively using. Um, on the other side, there's also co- your computer. Your, your PCs are also becoming much uh, more uh, powerful, and you could do really high resolution photogrammetry scans of real world places, um, and then create a VR experience. But I think that's uh, certainly become uh, easier, and is and I'm working on actually making it much more easier. So. Uh, documentation is kind of few and far in between. There's a lot of very easy guides, very low level tutorials, but, uh, it gets very, it's, uh, you can't find as much on the advanced stuff. You know, once you scan your teddy bear, you know, what's the next step? Uh, so that's stuff that, uh, I really want to work on as well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I would, I wouldn't have gotten to this place if I hadn't learned and collaborated with the people that I had. Um, and I think that's that's something that um, the internet can also help, like really spread out as to is people that are willing to document their you know the things that they've learned and to uh, to spread it online. Like everything that I've learned, I've learned because because of the internet. So that's um, I feel a need to, to to give back in that sense. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. One of the areas um, that I think will have a great impact on AR and VR is volumetric videos. But as they are very hard to make and they need very expensive studios, this area hasn't really took off as it should. Uh, what do you think about volumetric videos? Um, you're right. I mean, what what exists today with the studios and the captures and the you know high budget productions, it's 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 very uh, not accessible. Um, but I think that's you know. That that's only if you need to to have the video of the of behind the person, you know. Mm-hmm. Like if you need the video of the of their back and the back of their head, and like, <laughs> and I that's also a question that I ask myself. Like, you know, how important is it to have the entirety of the of the avatar? And you know, I'm, I guess in some cases, in, in some use cases, it makes sense. In uh, in a lot of others, it actually doesn't. Um, so thankfully, on that regard, like there's quite a lot also of advancement happening on making volumetric video accessible so depth kit is the uh the company i would point out to or the kind of the product i would point out to uh for people using uh even just a connect basically one yeah. connect uh and a dslr camera or i mean the the baseline even is just the connect without a camera uh you can do a um a volumetric video of yourself or of a of anyone and if you combine that with a photogrammetry scan by the way it looks super cool because like but first of all both of those things are coming from the real world so they have like 
you know, the same sort of lighting, the same sort of elements, but they also have the same sort of artifacts, the same sort of, you know, blobs and the weird, uh, just, uh -huh. you know, the, the weirdness that photogrammetry and volumetric video have are kind of complementary. And, and I think it, it will be interesting, I think, in the future to look back, and this will probably look like the, the, the grain that you would see in photographs, in early photographs, like, you know, terrible exposure, um, there's like very little detail, there's just a lot of grain, there, you can barely understand, like make, mm -hmm. out the, make out the details, people move, so there's like ghosting and shadowing. Um, I, I feel like it, this this glitchy look today is probably going to be seem is going to seem like a, a a style in the future. The uh -huh. same way now, also we put VHS you know video effects on Instagram videos that are captured with a really nice camera, but we we add like this look of the '90s video VHS. Uh, to it uh, to make it look more atmospheric. I can honestly see that becoming a thing in like 20 years for 3D models uh, <laughs> yeah. if, if they're really clean by then. So I guess your question is about volumetric video and what I think of it. I think it's interesting. Um, it's something that I've like depth good is something I've I've experimented with and I and I do think um, there's there's like quite a lot of room for improvement there. The use case again the, the use cases are are uh, not clear for everyone yet, including for people like myself. Like I have ideas for it, but I think even the ideas that I have for volumetric video are not uh, like are not that shared even amongst people that work on volumetric video. So it's still super early. Um, a lot of mistakes still need to be ha need to be made uh, for us to learn. Um, and yeah, for now it is definitely like if you want to do the full person video, like. There's there's ways of doing it for cheap, but it's not it doesn't look that great. Uh, if you know if you want to do the whole thing, you should go to like Microsoft Volumetric Capture Studio, exactly. um, and or I guess there's 4D Views also, which is uh, uh, another kind of there's, there's actually quite a lot. There's Volume there's Volume Volume Cap 4D Views. Um, anyway, we don't have to go through the list of it, <laughs> but I think what what will end up happening is. Again, our phones probably will will be um, the thing that uh, will be the enabling factor in having you know anyone that reads a blog post on the internet be interested and involved. Um, and in fact, you know, we start we're starting to see the early forms of it with the iPhone's uh, Face ID capture. You know, this has it has an active depth sensor in the in the front facing your face. So it's basically a connect. It's a small connect in your iPhone. Um, so there's ways of actually using uh, using that to to have a volumetric video. I mean, it doesn't have a very wide perspective. So as long as you uh, you know, as long as you're looking, you're watching the video from the perspective of the camera, then everything is great. But as long as you know, if, as soon as you put your head, uh, you lean left and you look at uh the the video you'll see you know all the missing parts um so maybe you know maybe machine learning will be interesting to fill in the gaps there but uh exactly i have no idea i have no idea how well how that will work um yeah it's it's definitely something um i think that will grow as 3d displays both ar vr and like light scale of volumetric displays grow because that like those two things go hand in hand and uh, the use cases will just be proven out by users. Like, as, as long as you have a lot of people trying things, you know, even one percent of those trials will result in kind of an amazing discovery. And um, you know, the same thing happened with VR. The same thing happened with drones. And I think the same thing will happen with uh, photogrammetry and volumetric video. Yeah, yeah. I remember John was working on creating volumetric videos using just a few Intel RealSense sensors before Disney acquired them. I think if we can democratize this field, it will revolutionize many other fields such as sports, entertainment, networking and connections, like for example having Star Wars style Skype calls. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, in fact, I saw something really awesome with the looking glass display and uh -huh. it was just a light field of a person's head. Uh, in fact, it was, it was a scan of a person's head but um, and just displayed in a looking glass, but it didn't even need to be. It could have been a light field photo array, um, so it didn't you know need to be converted into 3D or anything. But looking at that head, looking at that face in a block of glass, and looking at it from other sides, I was like, this is freaky. Like there's a head in there. There's a real head in there. And like, um, and I and I was thinking like how freaked out I would be if he opened his eyes. 
because uh, <laughs> the model's eyes were closed and I was like, I, I could, I see how the, you know, uh, the future form of Skype and FaceTime could be a volumetric, um, I can I can totally see that. I know you know. It doesn't mean that will replace other forms of communication the same way that video chat hasn't replaced, you know, other forms of communication. Voice is still extremely useful um uh as as a tool the same way that we we you and I are using it right now. Mm -hmm. Um even though there are more high fidelity ways of communicating, you know, it's for some reason for some uh, situations that makes sense and for others it doesn't but i really do think yeah with volumetric there's without a doubt that will be uh fascinating for uh for communication yeah exactly uh, but but the question it's an open question about if that's going to be useful for vr uh in terms of like vr uh, multiplayer vr you like to have uh avatar like two avatars talking to each other like that's most likely going to be uh like i said an avatar rather than a video because if you have something on your head uh, you know, a display uh, a VR headset on your head. Uh, a video of that is not as interesting because uh, you don't see the eyes, and you need to see the eyes. You need to see uh, the face. So probably, you know, using eye tracking, using uh, other sensors, kind of like in the headset to understand how your face is moving, and then recreating that on the avatar will most likely be, uh, or at least kind of maybe not most likely, but that's how I see. Yeah. Um, kind of VR communication starting to grow uh, and be more realistic. Yeah, actually Facebook and Oculus has done something exactly yes. like that. Their approach is reconstructing these contents and avatars using deep learning and that's also an interesting approach, I think. Yeah, no, it is. Um, that, that's kind of why I'm actually basing this opinion off of it is their avatar, um, their avatar system, well, it still requires a lot on the capture side, so they have to you know, sit down. In fact, that's actually what they talked about, is they said the uh, all this, basically everything apart from the capture is mm -hmm. is, is uh, by, not Moore's Law, but basically the like how technology is progressing, like it will be easier to, run, to render all of this in real time. Um, but the part they haven't yet, uh, it's it's not very clear as to how these avatars could be uh, used by everyone, or sorry, uh -huh. for everyone to have like a, yeah, a photorealistic recreation of their avatar. The the capturing is still actually a huge open question. They have they've had to use the this kind of Hollywood grade um, light stages where it's mm -hmm. a huge dome that you sit in, and then you have uh, hundreds of cameras pointed to your face, and then hundreds of LEDs next to those cameras, and then. You basically uh, you're taking you're 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 shining the light on the face from different directions and taking pictures and just to understand really like how your face uh, interacts with lights and you know and then getting all the maps like uh -huh. you know, your normal and, and all basically all the light information of your face um, that way and then from that you can um, create this like auto encoder avatar uh, so that they're saying yeah the, the capture side is actually the hardest part when it comes to uh, or probably the, not the hardest part, but that, that's going to be the, the, the part that doesn't seem super um, obvious how that will progress rather than the reconstruction of uh, the avatar in real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know about the technique you mentioned. Um, so Azad, you have your own podcast project called Research Realcast. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so this is something, this is actually my, the initial, uh, one of the first things I did when I was interested in VR, uh, I, when I was still in college doing a bachelor's uh, in computer science, sorry, in cognitive science, mm -hmm. um, and I actually met uh, my co-host also through Twitter, who was also a CogSci, um, who was also a CogSci student in Germany, in, uh, in University of Osnabrück. Uh, in fact, there were two of uh, two of us, sorry, three of uh -huh. us. Um, and, uh, we had this like really amazing Skype conversation about, uh, kind of everything that we had learned. This was our initial introductory call. And we were like, you know what, like all of this stuff that we've talked about, like we haven't read online so much, like put together or heard about. And we we're like, we have an interesting perspective in, in, in VR and AR, you know, for, for development coming from a background of, of, of cognitive science, of mm -hmm. you know, understanding how, how your brain works, how your memories, how attention works, like how all of these things uh, being extremely relevant uh, things to know as a VR developer and how you can use them. So that was the initial idea. And, and, and we started doing a podcast that was much like really 
heavy focused on, on like science and cognitive science. And basically we were trying to summarize a lot of what we just learned uh -huh. in, uh, in our universities that week and applying them to VR. Um, we also realized that was not so sustainable. And we also kind of, uh, we're all now on our separate paths away from science per se, but we're, I mean, we're also friends, but, and we're still doing the podcast, but, uh, I'm not involved in, you know, in research, uh, anymore. Uh, Peter uh -huh. isn't either. And, and so we're, we're applied. So, but, but the, the basis of our thinking is still there, you know, how, how, um, how do you approach the idea of VR and AR, uh, the display and the software, um, from a, from a cognitive science perspective. And that's kind of, you know, if you, if you're a, um, I don't know if you're like a stoic or something, you know, if you spent years learning about that, everything after that, you will always, you know, view through it from a stoic lens. So I guess <laughs> uh, I would make a similar comparison with CogSci. So nowadays the, uh, the conversations that you'll find on the podcast are much broader. Um, uh -huh. So uh, I like to, like, I guess the folk, the thing, the focus that I like to have is like on the design el element of VR and AR um, whether that's game design or whether that's um, interaction design. Um, so we've done episodes with like the leap motion designers when they were really prototyping uh, how to do things with your hands. Um, and now they've actually, those, both of those designers were hired by Facebook and now they're working on like uh, their you know, respective projects there. Um, we talk, we actually, our last episode was with Control Labs, um, right before they were acquired by Facebook, uh -huh. um, that were building this kind of like, uh, uh, this interaction system that sits on your wrist and, uh, you know, basically can understand intent, or that was kind of the idea behind it, uh, without having to actually move your fingers, um, but I'm also very much interested in like startups and business and like and strategy. So those are the, cause I've, I realized over the years, um, you know, design isn't really the only thing that contributes to like a product success. It's like kind of the context that the design is built around and all of that kind of comes from like strategy and understanding how these, you know, elements work together and how, you know, what company is doing what and where, you know, where are their opportunities? So I guess the podcast is a is an audit, aud, audible representation of of my learning journey uh -huh. from uh, 2016 to now 2020. Um, the things that uh, are interest me and Peter and the things that we've learned about and are cont continue to be excited by. Um, so if those are in topics that are interesting to you, then I would suggest uh, checking out the Research VR podcast. Sure, sure. Of course, that is very valuable. Um, thanks very much, Azad. Are there anything else you want to add? Um, I guess not. I have nothing in particular to add, except for I guess if there's you know VR and AR developers and enthusiasts or perhaps even students, um, you know, curious about this, curious about why these technologies matter, and you know, are, is this is this just a fad? Is this something that actually is going to stick around um i i would like to pe i would like to remind people that we are definitely in the winter of this industry kind of mm -hmm. the winter of vr and ar um and in fact we're starting to see the uh the little signs of spring that we're coming out of the winter um and, and the analogy i like to make is uh if you looked at bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh it had this little they had quite a boom actually and uh, the first early boom was i think 2013 2014 that was yeah. the first time um i read about it uh, that was the first time i you know purchased some bitcoin just to like feel like i'm a part of something um you know it's, um but in 2015 2016 uh i think and also early 2017 there was nothing like if you were a cryptocurrency company or a blockchain company, either people didn't understand what you did. And, you know, if you're talking to general public, they thought you were a madman um, and, or they just didn't care and didn't think this was, you know, they, they had heard about it in 2013 and they hadn't seen anything happen. You know, none of the products that they were using had changed since then. So therefore, cryptocurrency and blockchain were useless. Um, that's what you call a winter when all the hype is gone. Um, uh, the initial boom was there. The hype, you know, then goes away. And then there's a multiple uh, bunch of years that uh, the mainstream media either completely like craps on it or just ignores it. And uh, and that's that's I mean that's fine. That's kind of the the 
the the process in which these uh, niche technologies, I guess, grow. And this is something that kind of I'm learning by looking at other industries and realizing like, oh, we're actually, we're in a similar stage with VR where all the initial hype people that were kind of in it to make a quick, quick buck, uh, either dropped out or just, you know, uh, they lost all their money or like all their, uh, you know, they just lost interest and jumped to the second crypto hype bubble in 20, you know, 2017, 2018. Um, and in fact, I saw that in real time. I saw all these people that would show up for VR and AR events in San Francisco and yeah. suddenly only go to crypto events. And I was like, ah, oh, you're just bandwagoners. That's fine. Go away. Anyway, yeah. nobody, nobody needed you. Um, but the people actually, the developers that were, have been here from early on that really, I guess, saw the true potential of uh why this is interesting and why this is something that is worth uh spending you know years of your career in um are still around and they're some of them actually are doing really good uh maybe not not everyone is a millionaire in this industry in fact most people are not but um there's quite a few uh, even games now that have uh, made uh, you know quite a lot of revenue so i think you know i guess that it's kind of beating a dead horse trying to talk about is VR uh, a, a fad or is it something that's, you know, is, is AR just going to completely overtake VR and VR is going to be irrelevant? Um, I think even if you ask me that a few years ago, like four years ago, I would have said maybe or probably. But I think I'm starting to think the opposite now with, with AR. It's AR, every year AR is seeming to be harder and harder to achieve, to reach that, you know, that Ray Bans form factor that you, uh, you know, that we were all promised in like 2015. Um, and VR is starting to seem much more of a real shippable product that you can uh, buy today, you could set up today. Um, you know, it's, it's the hardware is getting much better, much more comfortable. And uh, people are actually doing a lot of interesting things with it. Uh, and users, you know, non-developers, non-enthusiasts are actually gaining value from that. Uh, so I think if you can survive the winter, there's like, there's a long spring and summer ahead. Like that, that that's, that's my only piece of advice is, you know, ignore the noise, ignore the, the news also. Just uh, if you, if you think you're onto something interesting, um, develop it, keep working on it. And, but don't develop it in isolation, post it on Twitter, post it on Reddit. Uh, it's really important to have that feedback from people because if you're doing something that's not interesting, then you'll see that it's not exactly interesting. If, uh, however, if you are doing something that is even slightly remotely interesting, there's actually huge potential to gain a lot of attention from, from, uh, you know, people that would be interested in that product because there's very little competition. So, um, yeah, I, I do have a lot of friends that are also developers and some of them are, you know, very disheartened. They're like, this is so hard to raise money right now. It's very hard to make even any revenue. But I think the important thing there really is like, if you can survive these next couple of years, and again, we're starting to get out of that really deep winter phase that was in 2017 and 2018. Um, if you can survive through those uh, years and kind of figure out a sustainable like revenue uh, for your company, whether that's just doing, you know, uh, projects and contracts for, for enterprise clients or uh, it's pivoting and doing something, you know, completely else. But uh, I think it's, it, it will pay its dividends if you've been around for a long time, if you understand, if you understand the technology uh, from a deep perspective and, uh, and you know, kind of where to put, you know, where to, where to hedge your bets and not get, um, not get distracted by hype technology. Uh, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Can't agree more. Well, Azad, thank you very much for joining the All Things XR podcast. I appreciate it. Much